Now, forgive me for jumping the gun slightly on this, but my suspicion is that Christopher Snowden, being a bit of a libertarian, will probably think that this ban on junk food ads before 9pm is a bit mad. Christopher, very good morning to you. Morning, Mike. How are you doing? I'm not so bad, thanks. Now, have I got this right? Are you uh, going to tell me that you think this is a bit of a, a mad move? Yeah, yes, indeed. It's a, it's a terrible idea. It's not going to work. And it's going to be much more extensive than people think. Mm. I mean, you've described it there as a junk food ban. Every, all the media are describing it as a junk food ban. It's actually a ban on the advertising of HFSS food, which is high in um, fat, sugar, or salt. Right. And that's more of a mouthful. So it's quite understandable the media just you know, shorten it down to junk food. But it's so different. I mm. mean, HFSS food includes pretty much everything, really, apart from fresh meat and vegetables and fruits right. including things like mayonnaise sausages fish fingers jam honey croissants quiche haggis right. I mean, there's a huge <laughs> list of things Most so does that mean here. does that mean if we get one of those sort of tesco ads where somebody's making something um they'll they won't be able to use the ad if it's got mayonnaise in it yeah that's a very good example actually because particularly when you get up to christmas time supermarkets tend to advertise a whole range yeah, of products or right. things that you're going to need for christmas and most of the stuff you need for christmas is either high in fat or in sugar or in in salt right. and nigella's adverts wouldn't stand a chance you know anything <laughs> of course involving chocolate wouldn't stand a chance but you kind of expect that perhaps. yeah what you don't expect is it to apply to butter and bacon but it will do so who's come up with this particular ban then? Is it the, uh, the is it the sort of advertising watchdog or who? No, it's it's the public health lobby again. You know, Public Health England have been pushing it quite hard. It's ironic, really. It's widely rumoured that Public Health England is for the chop because yeah. of its terrible uh, response to the coronavirus, and mm. yet it's getting this present in its in its final months. This is something it's it's always wanted to bring in. It's not being thought through. You know, um, I mean, the fact it's going to include all these food products. Kind of shows that it's not been thought through. The public health lobby just come up with these ideas and think, well, maybe this will work. Maybe let's try it, you know. But you can't make policy like that. This is going to cost commercial broadcasters about two hundred million pounds yeah, a year. Right. That's going to be, mean fewer programs, poorer quality programs, probably even fewer channels. I yeah. suspect some of the smaller channels might go out of business. So we can't just keep trying things in the hope that it might have some effect. Right. We kind of have pretty good evidence that it won't have an effect because if you remember back in two thousand eight. Um, the, the, well, the brown government, I guess, by then, um, banned all advertising for these products, so-called junk food, during any program that had a disproportionately large number of viewers under the age of 16. And as a result of that, and the fact that kids just don't watch as much television as they used to, right. exposure to these kind of adverts has fallen by about 70% since then. Well, this is Child the thing. Of, I mean, Child started... obesity has not fallen at all. No. That's the important point. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, as, as you will know as well as I do, you know, if you walk into any supermarket or any sort of, you know, um, petrol station to pay for your petrol, you know, you are presented with a, a vast array of chocolate and crisps and bigger, ever bigger bags and, you know, sugary drinks and all of that. Surely if they actually are serious about making people not want to eat and drink this stuff, then they either have to put a larger tax on it uh, or they have to ban the display of it or something like they did with cigarettes. Well, let's not start giving them ideas. Um, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> they'll come to that sooner or later. Oh, well, well Boris has said he's not going to put the tax on, though, hasn't he? Well, he said a lot of things. Um, for now, it doesn't look like he will do that. But he is looking to ban the display of things like crisps and, and sweets at the entrance and at the checkout and at the end of aisles right. in shops. Now, what effect that will have on things like petrol stations, I don't know. It's going to be extremely difficult, I would have mm. thought, for small corner shops and so on. Yeah. Well, this is the thing that I find strange because Boris, um, amongst his many kind of rather strange contortions while he's been in power, uh, he, he's got this obsession with cycling, getting people fit, walking. You know, I mean, that's not really what we elected him to do. Um, no, indeed not. Um, but, you know, it always seems to end the same way. Mm. You know, this is the fifth prime minister in a row who's had a bee in his bonnet about uh, you know, micromanaging the lives of ordinary law-abiding citizens yeah. for their own good. And, you know, quite honestly, if a Conservative majority with a pretty liberal leader like Boris, with a, a chief advisor who's anti-establishment and a majority of 80, if, if a government like that is going to bring in a raft of measures that even New Labour, you know, would have not given serious thought mm. to, then the game's up. You know, it doesn't really matter who you vote for. Um, you're always going to get 
the political class pushing this nanny state stuff on you. Yeah, it is ridiculous, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, there's all manner of things you could ban from being advertised. But, I mean, like, for example, I know that it's probably right to say now that fewer people are smoking cigarettes than than there used to be. But there was a time, say, several years after cigarettes were kind of outlawed and it was made, you know, almost illegal to smoke in almost any place of, of, of a public nature at all. It didn't actually affect the sales of cigarettes for quite a long time. No, um, smoking rates were, were pretty flat, actually, yeah. through that whole period when there was a lot of smoke, anti-smoking activity, starting with the smoking ban, but also the ban on uh, you know, vending machines, uh, the graphic warnings, all that kind of stuff came pretty thick and fast. And yet the smoking rate held at about 20%. It was yeah. only really when e-cigarettes came on the scene a few years later that it started to fall um, rather more sharply. So a lot of this stuff just doesn't work. You know, as I say, we, we know what happens pretty much because we've seen a massive reduction in exposure to these kind of adverts and we've seen no reduction in childhood obesity. Mm. I think at the very least, if the government is determined to bring this stuff in, we should ask for some KPIs. We should ask for some criteria of what success looks like. Yeah. And if we haven't seen a drop in obesity or whatever outcome they're looking at in, say, three years' time, they should be repealed. There should yeah. be a sunset clause. But it won't happen. All that will happen is it won't work. People will forget about it, and they'll be on to the next thing. Uh, they'll be go, well, why are we still allowing this kind of advertising be, you know, after 9 p.m.? Why right. are we allowing it on, on, on billboards or right. in magazines? Yeah. It never ends because there's never an audit of whether this stuff works or not. Right. And also, since most children uh, that I know, certainly mine included, watch YouTube almost all the time, I mean, are they going to outlaw ads on YouTube? Because that's where they're looking. Yes, apparently so. I mean, this is all based on rumours at the moment, we should stress. There's no, mm. There's been no official announcement, but Whitehall sources have told the Financial Times that, uh, yeah, they, they are looking at a total ban on digital advertising for these yeah. products. I know. Incredible, isn't it? Next thing, they'll be sort of peering through your kitchen window to see what you're cooking. Yes, I mean, it never ends. Um, and there's there's more advertising that's, you know, in the firing line. Gambling advertising is probably going to get the chop at some point. Alcohol advertising is under severe pressure. And, you know, this does have an effect on our media. I mean, you're, you guys, you know, you're, you're a commercial radio station. Um, you know, it's not as if there's an endless supply of advertising that are going to come in no. and fill the gap. So, we won't, be able to carry, industry, so, so we won't be able to carry any adverts for McDonald's anymore, then, if this goes on. If it goes on, yeah. I mean, radio would be a natural ex extension of the ban. Mm. And there's no reason why the ban wouldn't be extended. The, the principle has been conceded, essentially, that these products are too dangerous for children to see. Mm. And it may, you know, by the same token, too dangerous to hear about, too dangerous to see on a billboard and so on. So I think eventually, if we carry on like this, we'll end up with a tobacco style advertising ban, yeah. which is to say it can't be promoted in any form. It's in plain packaging. It's hidden behind shutters. Yeah. We're talking a few years down the line, of course, but the, you know, that's the direction of travel. And you said this is the fifth prime minister in a row that's kind of got involved in this kind of thing. Why do you think they're so obsessed with it? Because surely you would think, again, without wishing to give them ideas, the best way to tackle childhood obesity uh, is to go into the schools and have them do more PE, which has been severely cut back over the past several years because they haven't got enough PE teachers. Yeah, um, there is, I think, more than can be done there. You've got fairly cheap policies like the daily mile, where you get kids just to simply run a mile. Mm. It doesn't require much in the way of equipment or anything like that. Right. Um, and it keeps obviously keeps kids fit. Policies like that would actually, I think, have an effect. Um, but instead, we try and regulate the product. We try and blame everything on food, where in actual fact, in many, many cases, it's the physical inactivity that's the issue. Mm. It is. Uh, but I'll say, let's, let me go back to my original question. What, what is it about these types of policies mm. that are so attractive to who you would consider to be otherwise relatively intelligent and relatively non-interventionist type politicians? Well, in the case of Boris, supposedly it's been this kind of deathbed conversion when he was admitted to hospital with coronavirus. Mm. And it is true that obesity is a risk factor for, mm. for coronavirus complications. Um, but I think more broadly, politicians uh, are drawn to these kind of policies because they like to feel that they're making a sort of a big national impact on a major national epidemic. Mm. In actual fact, there is no epidemic of childhood obesity. It's a statistical fiction, really. Um, but they like the idea of doing it. They, they, they get plaudits from the right people, um, from you know, the Islington dinner crowd, as well as the public health lobby. 
for a few days at least before the public health lobby comes up with the next set of ultimatums mm. and and it gets some generally po- positive coverage people like being patted on the back by jamie oliver and feeling like they're doing <laughs> something and the fact that these these policies incur huge costs on various sectors of the economy and don't work is right. really neither here nor there well quite and as you say i mean if the uh, if the rate of obesity hasn't really changed over the years the only thing that has changed is the definition of obesity like a lot of these politicians what they like to do is redefine stuff and then that way they can make out that it's more of a problem than it actually is well certainly that's true of childhood obesity i yeah. mean the childhood obesity figures are, are just a joke we, mm. we do not use the international measure of childhood obesity um, and we massively over-diagnose the number of children who are uh, over- overweight and obese. Mm. The, the, the figure that the nanny statists always use is that one in three 11-year-olds are overweight or obese. Yeah. Well, show me them. Where are they? Yeah, right. I mean, any, anyone who drops their, their child off at school can see that this is just nowhere near the truth. Right. And yet we go along with this in a kind of emperor's new clothes fashion. Yeah. They have these growth charts. I don't know whether you've seen them, Christopher, but my, mm, yeah. my, my schools uh, that, that I've dealt with with my kids over the years, and they have these growth charts. And if your child seems to be on the sort of upper edges of it, they start sending letters to you saying, well, you know, he or she is looking like they're getting a bit bigger than average. And you go, well, you know, do you not understand the way that children grow? Some children grow faster than others. Some children have growth spurts. Some children uh, become taller, bigger, wider, earlier than other people, you know, and they seem to be completely incapable of understanding that. Every year, there are thousands upon thousands of parents who are baffled to receive a letter in the mm. post, usually from their school, saying your child is borderline obese yeah. or heavily overweight or yeah. whatever. And it's all based on those growth charts. I'm interested that you've, you've seen them. Those charts just involve somebody putting a line down it and arbitrarily saying, if you're above this line, yeah. the child is obese. And they're, they're based on literally no evidence. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And my, yeah. other, my other issue with the school, that, uh, and I'm sorry to, to keep using my own kids as, a, as an example, but it's the only, the only kids uh, example I can use, um, they sell in the school where they go uh, these ridiculous, um, you know, very, very fatty chocolate milkshake type drinks. And I keep saying to the uh, uh, the school, why do you carry, why do you have that? You spend all day telling the kids to eat healthily and then you sell this stuff in the, in the school canteen, which is about as unhealthy as you can get. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm not sure if my child uh, has a, has a pleasure of being offered uh, those particular ones. I know we we certainly did at school. I yeah. mean, a tuck, a tuck shop still a thing at school? I, I don't not know. really. It's, no, it's no, but, but, no, but, but it's worse. I mean, I don't mind if there's a tuck shop as long as we know that it's a tuck shop. But the idea that they spend all day telling you to eat healthily and then you go, "What did you have for lunch?" Oh, I had a Cornish pasty and a YooHoo um, chocolate milkshake, and you go, "Well, that doesn't sound particularly healthy." I mean, I don't really care, but let's not be hypocrites about it. Yeah, it doesn't sound very joined up thinking, but uh, I'm glad that uh, kids still have access to this. <laughs> well, exa- well, exactly right. Well, I mean, the kids still do what they always did do when I was at school, which is that you visit the sweet shop on the way home and buy bucket loads of chocolate. And that's what you do as your child, aren't you? Yeah, and that's another thing that the government could well be looking at, which is restricting uh, fast food outlets uh, to beyond uh, either 200 metres or 400 metres yeah. of schools. If you actually get a ruler out and look at all the schools in London, but in any in any major city, it means you effectively can't open a fast food outlet anywhere, except in you know the middle of the Thames or the middle of Hyde Park. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, again, it's a really badly thought out idea, yeah. and it's not just that these policies are illiberal that I oppose them, but although I do oppose them for that reason, they're they're just not practical. I mean, they're going to require so many. Um, exemptions mm. and carve outs and U turns. I mean, I'm glad really that the government's given itself this problem now because it's going to, they're going to have so many headaches trying to turn these silly ideas into workable legislation. And in the end, they're going to have to give up on a lot of it. Yes. Well, let's hope so. Christopher, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Christopher Snowden, the head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, quite sensibly saying this is a mad idea. It's a totally mad idea. You're not going to stop people going to fast food joints or not eating chocolate just because it's not advertised on television. All you're going to do is you're going to deprive, as he quite rightly said, broadcasting companies from the ability to actually make any money. And guess who that helps? Yeah, that's right. The BBC.